Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our event this, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Lori Higgins. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Detroit. I'm really excited um, that we're gonna be able to talk about such a, a really important um, topic today. We, we know that we've all been affected by the pandemic, but our young people in particular have um, been affected by um, everything that's been happening in their lives um, in the last two years. Um, I wanna thank uh, the Detroit Free Press and Bridge Michigan, uh, our two wonderful editorial partners who um, uh, signed on to co-sponsor this event with us. And I wanna get started. So I'm gonna turn this over to Isabel Lohman from uh, Bridge Michigan, and she is going to kind of help us frame this conversation that you're about to hear from, from our excellent panelists. So thank you for coming. Here, I'm Isabel Lohman, the education reporter at Bridge Michigan. Um, and we're really excited for this. We wanna talk about mental health because it's something that's affecting our students all across the state. Uh, I hear from educators every day that there are a lot of concerns in these schools. So to sort of frame this conversation, I wanna bring a couple different stories to light to help us frame this discussion. So my colleague, Robin Erb, who is a healthcare reporter for us, she reported alongside another reporter last summer um, about the sort of crisis that we're at right now. She was hearing from parents that have students who have very severe mental health needs, not being able to get the type of psychiatric services they need. She was hearing from hospital workers and other healthcare professionals that she was un that they were unable to place their patients where they needed to be. There just weren't enough psychiatric beds, there weren't enough providers, and children were getting left in the lurch and their families as well. Um, so I encourage you to check out those stories. You can find those on our resource guide. And now we're turning towards a time where kids are back in school, but all of the trauma and all of the stuff that has come with the last two years of this pandemic are still affecting children every single day. So we think it's really important that we have this discussion right now and that we can find some solutions for this mental health coverage. A couple other things I want to point out, Robin's reporting found that there was no child psych psychiatrist in the Upper Peninsula as of last summer. They found that the state's numbers of psychiatric beds for children was lower than what even the state said it needed, and that left, again, people hoping for more resources than they currently have, so I encourage you to check out those resources as well. But as we move forward, we have two moderators. We have Kobe Levin at Chalky Detroit, and we have Lily Altavina at the Detroit Free Press. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about both of them, and then we'll get started. So Kobe has reported for Chalkbeat Detroit for four years covering inequities in K through 12 schools and early childhood education. And Lily is the educational equity reporter at the Detroit Free Press. She's a Michigan native and she covers inequities in education across the state. So I'm gonna let them take over. Thanks so much as well. Thank you. So I'm Kobe, as Isabel said, I'm with Chalkbeat Detroit. Um, I just want to jump right in and start uh, introducing our rock star panel. Um, we have a couple of students with us, um, an expert in the field of mental health, uh, and a parent from, from our Detroit area who's deeply involved with, with her community. Um, let me start with uh, Thayaba Maimuna, a junior at Cusino Senior High School in Warren Consolidated Schools. I'd also like to shout out our other student, Britton Benjamin Kelly, who's a senior at Cass Tech High School. And our two experts are Elizabeth Koshman, the Executive Director of TRAILS, which stands for Transforming Research into Action to Improve the Lives of Students, and Amanda Holliday, who is a Detroit parent and Congress of Communities Early Childhood Program Director. All right, so we are going to um, run through some questions with our panelists and then uh, we'll circle back around to audience questions towards the end of the event. I want to start uh, with our students. Um, I'll put this question to you, Thayaba. Um, how has the pandemic affected your mental health? I think it really has affected me both negative and positive ways because because of the pandemic, I really have gotten like a lot more time to myself. And because of that, I really realized a lot of the things I guess I didn't realize beforehand, like, you know, like, like the things I struggle with and things that actually help me to cope. So I have really learned how to cope uh, on more like a positive way because of the pandemic. That's excellent. And I changed students 
through the pandemic. Um, we know that this has been a really difficult time for a lot of a lot of kids. Yes, that's very true. I think we really need to have more uh, professionals at our schools, just like we have doctors and nurses at our school to support students physically. I think it's really important for us to have uh, therapists and psychiatrists to help students mentally because that's just as important as for students to be like physically fit. And I, we really don't have that because now if we go and ask teachers like, hey, I'm struggling mentally, they would be like, go to your counselor and talk to them. But from my personal experience, that really doesn't go well because counselors aren't that experienced in that field. And usually they would just be like, so why are you struggling with this, right? But if you're, if you're asking me why I'm struggling mentally, that doesn't really help me. So yeah, I think we really need to have more professionals at our school. And speaking of professionals, Elizabeth, this question is for you. Some folks may not understand how mental health supports actually work in schools. Maybe a student loses a loved one and has been acting out in class. What kind of supports should be in a school, you know, for mental health intervention? Um, well, first of all, I just want to open by thanking you for your comment. Sayaba, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, that your sentiment is just so on target with uh, trails and our mission that we think that what's best for students is to be able to access those adults that are right in their buildings, whom they know, who they trust, um, who are familiar with their local community. Communities across Michigan are so diverse and distinct in their own unique ways. And we think that students have the you know, opportunity to connect with an adult in their building and get support that they need. And what we hear from our school partners is that those school uh, based uh, mental health professionals, counselors, as you named social workers, psychologists, nurses, in addition to all the teachers want so much to help their students, they feel really committed to the well being of their students and they want to help. Um, but sometimes the, what works in a research study, what's evidence-based practice, what's really meaningful support that they can offer um, remains really difficult for them to stay current in because of how inaccessible professional development can be or how many responsibilities they're responsible for in a school. Um, so, you know, I really hear you that you go to those adults that you really trust, but you might want a little more than you feel that they're ready to be able to help you with. Absolutely. And, you know, we've heard, uh, you know, over and over in, in our reporting, how the pandemic has really affected everybody, you know, across communities, and that includes adults in ways that trickle down to students. We're talking about stressed out teachers and stressed out parents. Um, Amanda, I wanted to turn to you um, to ask how uh, your experience as, as a parent that through the pandemic ha has impacted uh, uh, your your work with your own children and their well-being. Uh, sure. So uh, I live in Southwest Detroit. I also work at Congress of Communities in Southwest Detroit, which is a nonprofit. Um, and I have a four-year-old and a ten-year-old. Um, and so when the pandemic started, they were two and eight. Um, and um, it has been hard um, having them home and being a working uh, parent as well and like never sure if we're going to actually have, you know, in-person um, uh, school as, as soon as like in January there wasn't in-person school in Detroit public schools. Um, I also, um, they both go to a Detroit public school called Academy of the Americas. Um, and it's, it's been tough. I think it's been tough for a lot of different reasons for, for families um, across the country, but definitely across Detroit and Michigan. Um, just the uncertainty of it. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna start with Britton. You know, you're a student in the hallways at school, you're on the ground, you're seeing your fellow students struggle what do you do when you see a friend struggle um you know where what is your action as a as a student well the first thing i do is of course like ask hey what's going on um and if it's something outside of school um I, or even inside of school i try to give advice and if i can't directly help them um 
I'll say like, oh, maybe you should go to this person or that person. Um, in my school specifically, we don't have a lot of people to go to, but there are some counselors that you can reach out to that are actually very helpful when it comes to like anxiety attacks or like lack of resources like from home or something. Um, and you can talk to them about that. Um, but not every school has that privilege. And like I said, um, it's only those select few. Like our school has 2,000 children with three reliable people. Um, that's stressful for everyone. I feel like we need more people like that in our school and in other schools. Um, so if I can help directly, I will direct them to people who can help. Wow, and that's really great perspective. And Thayab, I'm wondering, you know, if it, when you do, you yourself are struggling or you see your classmates struggling, are you, do you think to go to counselors or teachers or do you look elsewhere? Do you look to each other? Do you think as students? Uh, I think I do not think of going to my counselors because that never goes well, at least for me. So if me or my friends or like people I know are struggling, I would obviously first, just like Brian said, would ask, hey, like, what can I do to help you? And if they like, you know, what do you need right now? And if that doesn't work and they, and they need further help, then I would like suggest to them to people I know that like we didn't say again, like that could actually be helpful. Or there are many like free sessions for uh, for people who are struggling mentally and that can also be really helpful. So I would like direct them to that instead of at, like telling them go to the counselor because that doesn't go well. So I feel like we're hearing from our student experts a little bit uh, about gaps that we see in, in the system of supports for student mental health. Um, Amanda, would you talk about what you've experienced in, in your community? Um, where are some areas where schools could do more uh, to step up for students who are in distress? Um, so in my day job um, at Congress of Communities, we have this amazing group of parents um, that's called uh, TAN, Taking Action for Nuestros Niños, or Taking Action for Our Children. Um, Southwest Detroit is um, a very um, diverse area, and so we have a lot of um, Spanish speakers and, and Latino families, so that's where the, the bilingual part of that comes from. Um, and they actually um, have, been an or have been a group for, for probably more than 10 years. Um, and the, every year they kind of ask, like they send out surveys and find out what is the, what do families want to focus on? Um, and this most recent year, 2021 um, school year, um, 2021, 2022 school year, they, um, the surveys all came back that parents wanted to talk about mental health. Um, and what they came back with is that like every kid needs to get some sort of um, profile some sort of survey something to see what level they're at or what needs they have and so that it's not just like waiting for an emergency to happen but just having like an overall how are the kids doing and then being able to to kind of meet needs before they become emergency level or see where a kid might be struggling and have those kind of questions in this survey or what, whatever mechanism it could be um, to be able to kind of see helping those counselors who in the chat, someone said that the state of Michigan is supposed to have one, at least one counselor per 250 kids. I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't know who put it in this chat, but if that's true, that's, that's crazy. Even, even, um, and let alone um, what Britain said about having like three or four for like 2000. So um, it's definitely, that's a, a need for sure of having, once you do these surveys, having people to follow up on them and having enough people in the schools. I think another thing um, is sometimes in schools, especially in Detroit, uh, the focus is on um, like policing or security guards or like making sure that schools have those things and, and not necessarily like thinking about the, the mental health of the students, but just automatically assuming the students are gonna do bad things um, and not really getting at the core reason why and behind like why there are problem behaviors. That's what I think. And Elizabeth, um, you know, many school districts are struggling to hire counselors, social workers, and psychologists. Besides bringing on new staffs, what kind of support systems would also help student mental health that, you know, schools can implement? 
So I think, Amanda, you touched on some points that are so relevant. Um, you know, part of the problem is that there may be a job description when you are hired on at a school as a counselor or a social worker. I love that there's a small person joining our meeting. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, you may have a job description <clears throat> that has a scope of work that a counselor, a social worker, a nurse, a coach, somebody in the main office is supposed to be taking on. But at ratios like we're seeing in the chat, ratios that we're seeing nationally of many, many hundreds of kids to one, you know, pr primary mental health uh, professional, it's an all hands on deck environment where kids have relationships with people and they use that relationship to inform who they're going to go talk to. A student who's dealing with a mental health concern isn't going to stop and read, oh, this counselor is supposed to do academic college and career planning, scheduling, and the social worker is supposed to do special education assessment and recommendations. So I really need to go talk to this one general education counselor during their 0.2 FTE a week that's supposed to cover mental health. They're going to go to the adult that's available that they trust, that they feel safe and comfortable with. And so wrapping that staff with tools, resources, training, professional development, I think is a way to reduce reliance on a, on a solution that is more people in the buildings. Um, we have already seen that even with incredible funding opportunities, a lot of positions in schools go unfilled because the positions are incredibly demanding. They're hard, they're often under salaried, they're emotionally taxing, they're physically taxing, they're long hours. If you're a parent uh, or caring for a young person in, in the past two years, you've I guarantee you, you have read an email that was written after midnight and before 5 a.m. from somebody that works in your school. And so um, I think we have got to reframe our understanding of who these individuals are working in our buildings and um, ensure that we're not setting them up for failure and burnout and exhaustion by expecting sort of off the record that they're gonna do all this work and not fully acknowledging it and fully wrapping them in support to keep them feeling resilient despite all the you know incredibly emotional draining work that they're asked to take, take on. Absolutely. And that can create an environment that uh, really doesn't feel supportive for students, where, where students may be among a lot of adults who just don't have the capacity to support them. Um, at the same time, you know, we do hear from students about the, the very deep and fulfilling relationships that they have with teachers, social workers, and folks in their schools. Um, I wanted to turn, uh, Thayaba, to you and ask you, what gives you hope about, about uh, uh, the approach that that our, our schools are taking to mental health right now? I think the hope uh, it's just that I really hope that things get better. It's like my, my belief kind of like telling myself, hey, things will get better. And that's like the only hope that I have right now. Literally nothing else. And, and, and when you when you say things getting better, are, are you thinking of like additional staff that would be supporting students? Yes, because I think uh, there are many people who are really working towards making, you know, making changes. And I really believe that that can happen if everyone works together and tries their best. So, yes. Cool. Britton, could I turn the same question to you? Hope, you say? I have no hope whatsoever. I feel like um, the only people who are actually doing something are the students because the staff, they kind of just have to listen to their higher ups. They can't say, actually, I don't want to do that because they'll just go to teacher jail or get fired or whatever. Um, I feel like the students and the youth, they raise awareness. They try to come up with their own programs, their own resources. We have to, we're working together because we feel like there's no one else who can do something for us. Um, it really seems like adults don't listen. Like, they tell us to come onto these meetings and then they ask a few questions and then that's it. You don't see anything else afterwards. They're like, thank you so much for coming. Like, I'm so glad you shared this with us and then nothing happens. So we just have to do it ourselves. I have no hope, hope whatsoever. 
So we're getting a, a message loud and clear uh, for any policymakers and people in power in the room that, that, that the kids are wanting us to do better. <laughs> All right. Um, now, there is a really interesting uh, audience question, Britton, that I feel like directly addresses what you were just talking about. Folks really want to know how can adults create an environment where students feel comfortable coming forward and talking through some of this hard stuff um, with, uh, with adults or other trusted individuals at school? In my district, there are a few student representatives that come to the space with adults, but I don't want student representatives. I want multiple students, like I want as much students as teachers and administrators and people on the school, school board, like, and we should be on the same level. I should be listening to you the way you listen to me. Like, I don't want it to be, oh, you're a student, you're a teacher, you're a parent. I want us to all be on the same level where we listen to each other because we're all in the same community. Everything we do affects each other. Thank you so much um, for that uh, perspective. That's that's really important. We appreciate it. And we have some other audience questions from Abby for Elizabeth. Are there any examples of districts using funds to target issues of racial equity and mental health? You know, hiring counselors of color or multilingual counselors, increasing anti-racist or trauma-informed training for mental health providers. Elizabeth, are you seeing any of this in schools? Um, I think that equity is an enormous issue um, for so many leaders in this space. And I know I was fortunate to sit on Governor Whitmer's COVID recovery uh, team thinking about return to school, both in the first year of the pandemic and as we approached year two. And equity was front and center on her mind as she was assembling that team. And many, many of, the, of our conversations and the membership in those committees were really centering equity and anti-racist practices as at the forefront. Um, that being said, we are living in a system where we see real disparity across districts and the burdens that kids are bringing when they're coming into school and um, the, the data is abundantly clear that these social determinants of health set up kids for an increasingly, uh, we call it like the, their backpack, an increasingly heavier backpack um, in when they're in communities that have lower resources, um, you know, higher rates of poverty and homelessness, higher rates of trauma and disenfranchisement in the community that sort of feels that their voice is not heard and appreciated and valued. Um, we see it in the way that voting uh, rights are, you know, are being uh, addressed on a national and, and state level. So I think that there are so many systemic issues that it's going to take, a, you know, a, a true collaborative effort to bring policymakers, bring our legislators, bring our leaders. And really, I think, I mean, Britton, you're, you're so clear in your thinking and so right on that student voice is really um, underrepresented at those tables, and yet you are the future, you know, of our state and our country, and you are seeing firsthand the the effects of um, systems and structures uh, that have really, um, you know, discriminated against Black and Brown students, students of color, and other, you know, racialized, marginalized populations. Um, that I, you know, I hear you. I, I'm really impacted by your comment that you don't have hope because what do we have if we don't have hope, right? Not much left. So um, I think that schools are trying. I think that there, there is a lot of learning and a lot of systems that need to be addressed from many angles at once. I don't think one system is gonna get this right. So we have a question from Kara and I'm gonna put this one to you, Amanda. Um, the question is what can be done to actually encourage parents um, to engage with the existing system of mental health supports around their students. Um, for a story that, that I, I just finished, uh, one of the things that the parent emphasized to me was my child was in a mental health crisis and I didn't know what to do. Uh, she had to call around, she was sort of frozen, she's dealing with feelings of guilt now that it, she was too slow to react. Um, so what are some steps that can be taken to actually integrate parents, who are obviously you know, key players here, uh, into the system? Um, I, I think parents need to know about it. Um, if you ask me right now, I have 
no idea what the system at my kid's school is for um, having, truthfully, I don't even know counselor, how many counselors they have. I don't, I don't know. Like it's not on my um, radar as just, you know, a typical pa working parent. Like you're just, you're not, you know, don't go down to the school unless there's a problem. Um, so I think like maybe having um, some kind of like documents sent home to families so they can know what's available um, in the, you know, in the beginning of the school year, um, knowing who they can reach out to and how. Um, I um, really appreciate um, the, the youth on here that have been sharing um, their thoughts. And um, I think that I did want to say something else about, and it's come up a lot in the chat about like not having um, counselors to take these positions um, or social workers or, you know, people that have been trained. And I think that that's like really important to create a pipeline of pe for people so that they can go into these careers um, and, and, and making sure that that pipeline too is um, includes people of color and includes people that um, look like the kids and, and have the experiences that the kids they're serving um, have. I think that um, that's like a really important part of equity is making sure that um, you can feel represented um, and, and um, be able to have someone to talk to that's had similar life experiences as you. Um, and so I think that that's something really important and that requires us to be intentional about training people up. And it also takes a really long time. I think, you know, we're talking about COVID funding and it's going to be running out in like, I don't know, however many years. Um, and so will people be trained by then? I don't know. And so I think it's, it needs to be more than just right now um, that this is a longer term mommy, thing. Mommy, mommy. That's my thoughts. Mommy. Thank you for that. And so I have a question for uh, our students and we're gonna start with you, Thayaba. If you had access you know, to the federal funding that your school has access to, what would you change about your school when it comes to supporting students? What would you spend that money on? Uh, that's a great question. I think the first thing I would really change is get professionals like I um, mentioned at the beginning because we really need that. So the first thing I would really do is try to hire professionals like therapists and psychiatrists to help students mentally because we already have nurses and doctors, at least at our school, to help students physically because they really give importance to athletes. But if you're giving importance to athletes and students, you should also give importance to their mental health because that too is really important. And so I really think that if I would have that power, then I would try to hire professionals that could help students mentally. And Britton, same question to you. You know, if you have that that school wallet and you could spend your money on something to to change, you know, to support students better, what what would you spend that money on? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I agree with Iba about um, more professionals in schools. Um, I guess we should also hire more of teachers and administrators in general. But uh, the thing is, money can only do so much. What we really need is power. We need to change the rules. Like, um, especially in public schools, um, there's you know certain curriculums that we have to follow and teachers literally aren't allowed to step outside of those curriculums. And that can really affect the students learning and it's just really unfair. But that's just one thing um, that could affect people in the space in school. I feel like board members, the people who make the decisions are so disconnected from schools that they don't even know what we need and they don't even ask us. So they have the money, they're just not using it properly or using it in the way that would be beneficial to um, students and teachers, in my opinion. Can I just offer a response to that? I, I think that your comments are so on target. Um, obviously we have two amazing students that really understand this issue so well. I'm so impressed by both of you. And I just, I hear a couple of things that really resonate with me uh, looking at this from another lens. One is that the healthcare sector is never going to be adequate to address the needs of our students 
and it's set up to be a problem responsive system, right? You go to your physician, you seek out services when you have a health concern. Maybe we have a well child check once a year. Mental health doesn't work that way. There are strategies and lessons. I hear people you know, writing about it in the chat about executive skills, time management, self-care, social emotional learning, wellness. All of these techniques are so important and they're not gonna be provided in the healthcare sector, they're going to be provided in schools. That's where kids live all day long until you know, they're adults. Um, and that's where they feel connected, that's where they can connect with their peers and again, those trusted adults. But if the rules remain, the classroom is for you know, reading, writing, and math, um, and our school professionals are, you know, remain at these ratios, there is no way that kids are gonna get the support that they need. So I, I just could not agree more. Education has to be central to the solution here. It's a public health emergency, so we need a public health response. And um, we need to think about accepting the role that schools are playing, not trying to put barriers around and say, it's not our job, it's not our backyard, it's not our problem. It is our problem, it's collectively our problem, and the education sector is our best shot at, at providing an equitable uh, response and solution. Elizabeth, that's, that's so funny. I feel like you were almost addressing a question that very specifically came through the chat for you. Um, but I, I think this is a good, a good way to kind of look at what you're saying from another lens. Vicki asks, currently at our school, we have a mental health class where scholars learn about mental health, coping strategies, et cetera. Do you feel that uh, such courses are beneficial for students? Is that to me yes. to respond? Oh, I, I, it, it is crazy to me to think that we can get kids through school and not make this a central part of their education. Kids cannot be expected to excel in their academics, apply to college and, and, and you know, make it without anyone along the way helping them develop and helping their families reinforce a really you know, effective set of strategies for promoting their health and wellness. And I think um, the homeschool connection, the community school connection is central to that, that if we're on the same page and we're doing this work together, it's going to it's going to be cohesive and comprehensive and kids are going to feel like the system makes sense. If it's piecemealed that your family teaches you something and your you know, doctor teaches you something and your teacher teaches you something and your school counselor and your health class and there are all these different um, messages, it becomes noise uh, and watered down and, and vastly less affected. So absolutely a thousand percent agree that that has got to be a central part of our educational plan. And Amanda, we have a question from Shana. Can you talk a little bit more about your work with Congress of Communities and what support you all are able to offer families and schools? And if you have any advice on how schools can better work with outside organizations, how do you make those kinds of partnerships really effective? I would love to answer that question and I will answer it after Thayaba goes because I think she had her hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I really wanted to just add on about um, about having classes at school about mental health because I think we really have to get more people to know that mental health is real because I still till this day have students who come to me and make jokes about oh you're depressed why are you depressed how is that possible like it's still it's so unfortunate and so sad that I still have to like till this day see students and even sometimes staff just like not taking mental health seriously and not taking their students seriously when they say that they're struggling mentally. So I think it really is important for us to like have classes that really teaches students and just everyone that it is something that we have to be aware of and that it's really important. And also, I wanted to add that I think it would be really, really great, although I doubt that'll ever happen. But it'd be really great if we could have like, at least like once a month, like a mental health day at school or we just like kind of like relax and do things that help us and kind of just really take that day off to reflect on us and ourselves because that can really be helpful, especially because uh, many students and teens don't get that chance. Like at home, they might be struggling with so much and that they don't have that opportunity to really kind of think about themselves and like kind of think, hey, I am struggling with this and I should take the time to take care of myself. 
and see if we could like get that opportunity at school. That would really be great for students. Thanks. That is an excellent point, Diaba. And uh, Britain just like kind of built on that in the chat. Britain, I wonder if I could ask you to just like reiterate what you typed there. Um, I believe this uh, quote comes from your mom. Yes, um, my mother is not very fond of our current uh, healthcare system. Um, something that Elizabeth said earlier um, about you go to the doctor when you have a problem, um, it made me think about that. Um, I think that in order to you know lower the awful months of health is to make sure that it doesn't get to that point. Uh, we have to think about what is causing this to happen and how do we stop the cause? I don't wanna solve the problem, I wanna stop the cause, you know what I mean? Um, and what Taiba said about mental health days, absolutely. I personally take mental health days like unauthorized by my school, I just don't show up. And they're so helpful. I just completely take away the student part of my life. And I, you know, I'm a daughter, a sister, a friend, um, an activist. And I just take that day for myself to be me and, you know, forget about all the worries of being a student. Um, I feel like people don't want to do that because of this um, perfect attendance thing. Students get awarded for perfect attendance and they feel like um, they'll be a bad student if they just don't show up to school. But in the meantime, they're stressed and overwhelmed and they're not taking enough time for themselves. So it's just so much overlapping each other. Um, so, yeah. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, back to Lily's question for me. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm a Detroit parent, um, but I also work for Congress of Communities. And going back to that taking action for Nuestros Niños group that um, Congress of Communities has, the reason why it was founded is because um, parent leaders in schools, so think PTA presidents, um, wanted support from each other. Um, and so often what happens in a school is um, there's a parent group and it's kind of like, hey, you have leadership skills, you run for president, right? Um, and then um, these people that are just parents, they don't necessarily have any, um, uh, any experience working in schools and experience in anything. And all of a sudden they're the president of the PTA. Um, and so they, they wanted support. They wanted to talk to other presidents of other PTAs in Southwest Detroit and have kind of that camaraderie and have, get advice, get training. Um, and that's where we that's where we started with that um, is because the schools couldn't do it themselves. Now they have gotten better. I, I do have to say that Detroit Public Schools does has gotten better and has started to do some some trainings for for parents, and it's definitely um, available now where it wasn't as much before. Um, but we have a whole system um, of uh, doing a fellowship with them and making sure that they're um, not only just talking about leadership but also talking about self-care and wellness. Um, so we focus in on, you've got to be good for you so that you can be good for your kids, so that you can be good for helping your whole school, right? If you're the PTA president. Um, and so that's what we've been able to do with Congress of Communities. Um, and yeah, I think I answered what your question was before. Thanks so much for that, Amanda. Um, another question for you, Elizabeth. Um, We've run into this issue uh, several times in this conversation. Folks would like to hire more mental health professionals. It's not always that easy. There's a shortage of qualified folks. Um, but districts do have you know, pretty significant funding right now um, to, to take some steps here. What can districts do uh, when that, that first step, of hiring a new social worker, uh, isn't an option for them? So it's a, it's a huge problem, right? I don't have a quick, easy answer. I have some thoughts about it. Um, you know, one has to, to do with the problem. So we, I've seen this in, in some of my work, even in schools in Detroit, that they have positions that are funded through these COVID relief packages. And the positions say right at the very top line, this is a short term position funded by these dollars. And it is not expected that this position will continue. And if you're a really like qualified, in demand, you know, mental health provider, why would you take that job when you can have a different job that does, you know, leave you with some stability? So I think that schools have to, uh, you know, I mean, they have to be met with, uh, 
you know, support from their representatives at the state level from, you know, budgets, but they have to be able to say, we are going to find ways to fund this. We are going to pay for this beyond those uh, COVID relief dollars expiring so that it becomes, you know, we've heard from our students, they don't want this to be a sideline issue. They want this to be a central issue. And I think schools can be responsive to that by, by saying we're committing to doing this work. I also think that the prevention piece is not to be underemphasized. That you know, mental health promotion can be deeply impacted by really strong self-care uh, practices. Teaching kids about you know decision making, helping kids with self-awareness, building a set of coping skills that are really effective and impactful. And if we pull that into the classroom space and we center schools using the staff that are already there who are devoted to these kids, if we equip them to engage in that prevention work, then maybe we'll see a demand that goes down for the more intensive services that require a counselor, a social worker, a school psychologist, a nurse, behavioral specialist. So I think you know part of the answer is, is a commitment, a philosophical approach to health and wellness uh, uh, in schools and districts. Um, and part of it is really prioritizing prevention, which is in every health area, the most cost effective way to, you know, to solve a health condition or health problem is to prevent it from occurring in the first place. Thank you. And this is a question for both of our students. Um, you know, I've talked to a number of students who have said sometimes seeing, you know, security measures or policing on campus, uh, metal detectors on campus can actually worsen student mental health. It can make students feel more anxious. And I'm curious if either of you have a perspective on that. You know, if you've seen these types of security or policing on your campus and, you know, how do you see that making yourself feel? How, do you, how does it make your fellow students feel? Uh, you know, any kind of thoughts around that? That's a really good question. Um, I uh, go to a school in DPSCD, Detroit Public Schools Community District, and we literally have our own police, like <laughs> DPSCD police, not just Detroit police, DPS police, which is very interesting to me um, because I don't really see that often in the suburbs. Um, also, yes, my school does have metal detectors. Uh, we have to go through them every morning and in the afternoon when we leave to go home. I don't see that in the suburbs very often either. Um, it's, I understand that we want to prevent criminal activity, but you know, it seems racist, quite honestly, um, when we're in a predominantly uh, minority community, but in the predominantly white communities, they don't have that. So I'm trying to understand if that's really the reason why there are metal detectors in school. And personally, it doesn't necessarily affect my mental health, but it does, you know, make me think what they really think of me and my peers. You're really right, Brendan, because I go uh, at a WCS uh, school at Warren, and I barely see any police or like we don't have metal detectors or anything like that. And I remember um, when the Oxford shooting happened, the uh, next day we had uh, a few places like that we never see ever, but that day we had security guards and all that, and half the students didn't show up because obviously they were very scared. But besides that, it was, it really like, kind of surprised me that we had that now, but we never did before. And just seeing uh, security guards like, you know, all over the school really did affect me mentally because I was like, whoa, like this is serious. Like, cause I never see it like usually. So I think you're really right, Brendan, cause I did go to a DPS city school before and having uh, security guards and metal detectors and things like that was really normal. Thank you so much uh, to you both for the super insightful comments. Um, I want to kind of uh, ask a question that will swing around to each of our panelists, starting with you, Amanda. Um, a lot of different folks uh, uh, in the chat, including uh, our Lisa, who we know well here in Detroit, are asking a version of the same question. OK, we're talking about this. I'm glad that we've, we're giving the issue a platform. But what can we actually do? Um, how do, how do you all see, uh, you know, with, within your scope and your communities, um, 
a, a path forward here to really changing things uh, in, in our schools um, to create a more supportive environment for students. Um, starting with you, Amanda. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I um, sometimes am with Britain there in that like, ah, oh, there's no hope, ah, the system is so frustrating. Um, I think that we can inform ourselves, right? And we can be part of it. Like, like right now, I know Detroit Public Schools is having these parent meetings about the, the funds um, and like, we should go to that. Hey, Detroit parents, on here let's go to those i don't know when the next one is but like look it up um you know i think i think we should pay attention um i i i tend to lean towards that people in power are trying to do their best um but if nobody tells them that something's a bad idea then they're not going to know right and so i think that if we can get around and tell them this is a you know this is the better idea um then i think we can we can start to make change and obviously it's not perfect and there are people that are you know doing things that harm people for sure but i i think that that's where we need to start is like getting involved and being involved thank you so much for that let's turn it to elizabeth how do we turn this conversation into action um, I think, I mean, so many, so many ideas that I promise give me hope uh, have been floated on this call. And I think that, um, it, you know, educating our, our decision makers, our policy makers is one, it, you know, I can say that I've had conversations over the past couple of years with leaders uh, in our state legislature on both sides of the aisle. Um, and there is not a household in Michigan that isn't touched by mental health concern. There isn't a household like that. And so this can be a bipartisan issue, but it's going to take a lot of educating and a lot of conversations. And they're hard and they take time. Uh, but I think that those conversations work. So I think that's one piece of it. We've heard about you know the, the upstream solutions, equipping our teachers, counselors, social workers, nurses, building administrators ensuring that all of those training programs give them the tools they need to be a resource. You know, we heard Thayaba in, the, in her opening comments said, I go to these people, but often they, you know, don't seem to know how to answer. I am absolutely not saying that that is any profession specific. I think that is human specific. We don't all have every skill when we enter the workforce. And I think an upstream solution where we make sure that the adults working in our schools are equipped to work in our schools and address what's gonna be right in front of them. I think that's a piece. And then until those upstream solutions have taken hold, I think that um, ensuring that schools have the resources, the professional development, the technical support and the community school partnerships. I saw DWIN was mentioned um, in the chat as a partner of DPSCD. I think utilizing those experts from the community to help strengthen and share the load of the work with the school uh, is really essential. We happen to have a state, you know, our governor is incredibly supportive of student mental health. She's a huge advocate for this issue. And she's also a huge voice, uh, you know, in, in terms of looking at solutions that uh, front and center the issue of equity and equitable action. So I think we have leaders that are willing to go out and, and really stand their ground for us. But I think we need to um, we need to just have a an end game long marathon approach to this. It's not going to be solved overnight. So it takes patience. I, I have to say this conversation gives me a lot of hope because I know that these two young students are going to grow up and maybe they will be the governors and they will be the policymakers and they will be the ones in charge. And I have just huge hope in future generations. So hang in there, you guys do not give up. Try to hold on to your hope because we need you leading our states and our countries in the future. Absolutely, and, and heck, we, we might not even have to wait. Britton, do you wanna talk about turning words into action? Yeah, um, I think the first step to action is acknowledgement. Um, a lot of people just wanna pretend like nothing's wrong and that there's nothing they can do, um, but there is a lot of wrong, a lot of things wrong. Um, and the more people 
realize that like the more we'll talk about it and the more people will be like hey maybe we should do something maybe we should listen to these people because um two people turns into four turns into eight turns into six, six, 16 and then people will start listening to us you know hopefully um and elizabeth about uh the no hope thing i have no hope in the adults i have hope in the youth though because um They've been in charge for a very long time and things have been the same for a very long time. Um, but um, it's always been the youth who have stepped up and had the direct actions, the protests, um, the informative uh, spaces, the mental health spaces. It's always been us. I mean, there are a lot of adults that are helpful. I have a lot of adult allies, but in power, they're not listening to us. And I know they're not. But, you know, someday they won't be here. There'll be different people in power. And hopefully it'll be the youth that are working hard right now to, um, you know, bring awareness and tell other people what we can do. Um, so, yeah, that's the first step is acknowledgement. Um, listening to each other is very important. And then after that, um, like I said, we just have to have more informative spaces, more mental health spaces. Um, more direct action. Uh, we can talk to as many people um, as we want. Hopefully there will be someone who would think, you know what, this person's onto something. I really need to do something. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Taiba? Oops. I'm not hearing you. Uh, yes, I, I I don't know what I was to say something. Um, I totally agree with Britain. I think we really have to first acknowledge because if we don't acknowledge the issue first, like what are we gonna do? Because like I said before, not everyone like still like know about this, and not everyone believes that it's real, and that is really sad. And I think I can't blame adults or the staff, even though. I really, I just can't because I understand that they grew up in a different environment, but at the end of the day, are they living under a rock? Like, do you not see, like, you know, do you not see your, your um, um, kids and, you know, like people just young kids struggling? So I don't blame them, but at the same time, I wish they would understand or at least try to understand our point of view and what we're going through because that really is needed because we need adult support. As much as we need youth to like step up and do their thing, I think if we don't have adults supporting us and trying to understand us, that can't exactly happen, at least for now, because we don't have the power. Even though Brian said like if we have four people and they don't have you know like sixteen and things like that, we will have more people and they will you know like we'll have more power in that way. But if we don't have uh, people like that in power right now supporting us, then that'll only make it harder on us. And I don't think it's too much to expect, at least like now, like right now, to expect people in power to support us, especially when it comes to mental health, because it's 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 like I hear like, there's so many, so many people struggling with, with mental health. And I see like every day, like on the news and like, on like all, all of our social media people, like people killing themselves and all that. And it just like hurts me so much because I'm just like, they could be, they could have been helped, but they weren't. And yeah. Oof. Just gonna sit with that for a second. Um, yeah. Tell you about um, Britain, Amanda, Elizabeth. I wanna thank you all so, so much for a fascinating panel, um, fascinating and empowering, I hope. Um, for the people in the chat, uh, we all have an opportunity to turn what we've heard today into, into action. Moving, um, and uh, I just wanna let folks know uh, as we wrap up um, that when you exit this event, you will see a survey pop up in your web browser. Um, has to do with this event, uh, please take a moment to fill it out. Um, we'll also be following up with an email that will include a recording of the event, um, a recap, just a, a summary of what went on, 
And maybe most importantly, a link to our resource guide. And I really wanna take a minute and shout this out and folks at Chalkbeat put together an excellent set of resources. If, you were, if you're a parent um, wondering how to address mental health concerns with your, stu with your student, um, if it's a, you're a student activist looking to, uh, to, to make change in your community, um, there's a lot of material there, organizations to call, numbers to call, um, in, information from reputable sources. So I would encourage that folks check that out. Um, and uh, as Tracy's saying in the chat, share the, uh, share the recording widely, spread the news. Um, the students need more support in our schools. Okay. And I think, <laughs> someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's all. Um, again, thank you so much to our brilliant panelists, our brilliant students. I hope you all have been checking out the chat because there's so much love for you in there. Um, folks are, uh, are, are hearing what you're saying um, and, uh, and, and are out there work, working to support you. Um, so again, folks, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, Lily, um, you wanna sign off? Yeah, thank you guys. I want to thank our panelists, especially our students for showing up and for all that you've said. Thank you, everyone.